Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Martin O'Reilly, and uh, I'm director of. Uh, oops. Uh, research Engineering at the Alan Turing Institute, uh, which is the UK's National Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. Um, and there I run the Research Engineering Group, which is a, a team of research software engineers, research data scientists, research data wranglers, and research computing engineers. And we work across the Institute's research program to um, produce robust, reusable software, uh, reproducible, trustworthy analytics pipelines, um, reliable research-ready data and, and get all that running at scale on, on the sort of uh, compute infrastructure that we've got access to. And the team sort of spend most of their time embedded into the Turing's research programs, sort of bridging that gap between research and practice, getting those algorithms out there, applied and validated in the real world. Um, but we also support the Institute's research infrastructure. So that's the sort of research-ready data, the uh, large-scale research compute we've got access to, and our trustworthy environment for, you know, research environment for working uh, safely with sensitive data. And uh, along with colleagues in a sort of tool practice and systems program, the community management and, and uh, um, uh, research application managers and our colleagues in, in, in program management, sort of we support the Institute's wider kind of skills and, and, and the sort of communities that we're, we're sort of part of, running some sort of training and, and, and drop-in sessions um, and, and, and sort of the, the kind of knowledge exchange at the Institute. And I'll talk about a few of the external communities we've been part of building and forming as, as part of this talk. So today I want to talk about kind of what effective research communities are and, and sort of how we build them. And I'm going to talk about what, you know, what are research communities for? Why, why do they form? Why do people join them? What do they do for their members? And sort of how do they get organized? How do they sort of, you know, sort of run themselves so, so that they can deliver these benefits? And across these sort of examples I'm going to talk about today, you know, what have there been the challenges we've seen? Um, you know, what insights and lessons have we learned about sort of how, to, how to make these communities a success? So the three communities I've sort of chosen to kind of use today as exemplars to tease some of this out. Um, are the research software engineering community. So this is a, you know, a wide community for people doing research software engineering as part of their job, not just people who are called research software engineer. Um, and it's evolved over the years into a professional society, of which I'm a, a trustee at the moment. Um, the second community I'm going to talk about is the UK's uh, trusted research environment community, which brings together the builders, uh, the folks who build, run, and use trusted research environments and all of the information governance and policy work around that. Uh, and the third one I'm going to talk about is the Turing Way, and we've got some colleagues from, from the project here today, um, which is uh, a sort of inclusive, collaborative, co-creation community to, to sort of um, you know, bring together, to, to ca capture, curate, and, 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 and generate uh, sort of guidance on uh, sort of re uh, reproducible, um, ethical, collaborative, sort of data science. And both the UK Trusted Research Environment community and the Turing Way have workshops later this afternoon, so please do drop in to those if you're uh, interested in learning more. So let's start with that first question. What are communities for? Why do they form? Why do people join them? What do they do for their members? And we'll take sort of each one as an example, and then I'll try and kind of draw out some commonalities across those as we go. So with the RSE community, I mean, it's, it was for researchers who code. So back in 2012, there was a, a sort of crowdsource session at the um, Software Sustainability Institute's collaboration workshop, and a bunch of postdocs who wrote, mostly wrote code in their job sort of came together to sort of say, well, look, you know, our big output isn't papers, it's software. That kind of doesn't fit with the academic credit system. It's hard for us to kind of have a career structure that works here. And, um, and really, you know, so sort of, they sort of found themselves as common sense of identity, and they coined research software engineer as, as a name for it, as a thing for the work that they do. And, and, and that's become, you know, something that's widely recognized and understood. And I think we see a lot of roles like this in academia that kind of don't fit that kind of classic postdoc lecturer professor sort of pathway and, and don't have, you know, the, you know, their outputs aren't seen in the same light as the kind of classic papers mean prizes um, sort of set up. And, you know, the main purpose of coming together was really, you know, to break, you know, a lot of these folk were the only person doing this work in their group and, and to bring together and share knowledge and practices and, and sort of understand what it is um, that they're, you know, this profession and this work that we're doing and, and to provide that mutual peer support. 
And that's not, not just for us as individuals, but sort of how do we structure this work within our organizations? And a key sort of value for the community has been defining this role and this career pathway. And a, and a huge thing that's come out is, you know, in the first year, in 2012, there was the first research software engineering group in, in the UK. And since then, that's grown to sort of at least 40 of which, you know, Groups like the Turing's have a wide range of these sort of research infrastructure professionals in and other groups beside us in the organization with different roles. Um, and I think that's been a huge part of the, 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 the reason people sort of join this community. And in terms of what it does for its members, well, I think primarily it's a big active online community space. We've got 6,000 people from the UK and, and, and overseas. And, you know, compare that to 700 members of the formal society. You know, the community is the people who turn up. Um, there's provide support for community subgroups. You know, it's a big, diverse, broad community, and um, you know, connecting and, and supporting those people who have you know particular interests or, 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 or particular shapes of role to, to kind of get together and do that work together. Um, it provides some funding for events and initiatives, both to run them and, and to sort of have access to them, and, and uh, you know, where people wouldn't otherwise be able to attend. And for the last three years, we've run a mentoring scheme, which has been sort of like hugely sort of well subscribed. Uh, to sort of help people kind of understand their career and, and, and where they might go next. Um, and then a really big part is we run an annual conference. So we did our eighth one this year. I had 500 people, sort of uh, about you know, a fifth of those online and, and, and the rest in person. Um, and that's just a, a place to bring the community together sort of for an intense period of kind of connecting and co-working. So if we compare that to sort of these other two communities I'm going to talk about, what does that look like for the TRE community? Sort of what, you know, why did it come about? Why do people sort of join it? Well, in this case, I think it was more about the organizations and the individuals. You know, there was all these people sort of building, running, maintaining, and using trusted research environments in different places. And certainly when the Turing started to have a need for one and, and we were looking around for sort of information about how others had, had done it, it was very difficult to kind of make those connections and, and, and sort of access that information. Um, and I think us and Dundee has started to do some work connecting out into the community and lots of people have been engaging. And then when those two kind of feelers connected, sort of there was this idea to bring a, a, a set of people who were interested in building a, a, a single platform together to, um, you know, to like, a, a workshop to, to, to sort of connect and collaborate on that. And, and again, the big sort of driver for this, I think, is, you know, both for the organizations and the individuals involved to share that knowledge and experience with their peers. Um, and to capture and curate some of these good practices, and I think you know critically to openly share these um, so, so outputs and learnings, so that you know they are available to others and not just those who were sort of there at the meeting at the time. Um, and um, again, a common theme: so the skills development and career pathways. You know, a lot of the roles required to support these environments and working with sensitive data safely are not your classic kind of like academic uh, sort of career roles. And, and so, how do how do those people sort of develop and? And, and, and sort of upskill in their, in, in their roles. And in terms of what the community does, I think it's, you know, for its members, I think it's sort of fairly similar. It's got this big active um, sort of online community space. There's quarterly community meetings that provide a place both for the whole community to come together, but also for working groups to connect and organize and, and do some co-working together. Um, these working groups are also the sort of forum for ongoing collaboration between those, those kind of synchronized sessions. Um, and a big part of what we're trying to do is connect work across organizations. So we're doing a lot of similar things, facing a lot of similar challenges, and often we're solving the same problem in different places. If we can bring that work together, you know, that's, that's sort of really powerful. And if we can do that in a way we can tell other people about it and maybe makes it easier for the folk uh, for which that's a problem sort of later on. And we can also come together and try and sort of get some funding to do joint work together. And again, sort of the community provides a forum for openly publishing these outputs, but also the sort of, you know, the content of our meetings and so on, so that you didn't have to be there to get the benefit. And again, there's an annual workshop, which is just feel it's like a really um, important way to bring the community together in a sort of deep and meaningful way and sort of connect and uh, sort of refresh and, and the enthusiasm and, and, and the connections that can drive this work forward through the year. Um, and then finally, sort of looking at the, the Turing Way, well, it originally sort of started out of a, a sort of sense of frustration in you know, how hard it was to get good baseline reproducibility practices, even at a National Institute for Data Science, um, uh, with the goal to sort of produce a good enough guide for reproducible research. And from the beginning, it's had this philosophy of curate rather than compete, find the stuff that people have already done out there, sort of wrap that up with some guidance around how to choose things that will work in your um, sort of uh, situation. 
and, um, and sort of provide people with you know, assistance in effectively leveraging those. And again, since the beginning, this idea of an open community-driven co-creation has sort of been an integral part of, of the community. Um, and, and in terms of what members sort of get out of it, I think having this learning together in an open collaborative sort of space and learning sort of what these you know, open collaborative research practices should, should be and co-creating them together is a key part of the sense of identity and, 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 and value that people get from it. Um, and, and providing that welcoming environment for that shared learning. It's a huge kind of open collaborative research is a huge topic and sort of being able to come in um, and, and sort of feel your way in that community and be welcomed as part of it is a, is, is a key value. And the community is really explicit about providing that support to grow and develop in the community, that path from consumer to contributor to sort of community leader. And in terms of, you know, what does that look like in practice? What are the things the community does? Well, you know, a big thing for it is that output, this handbook for reproducible ethical and collaborative data science that's expanded beyond, you know, the initial sort of focus on reproducibility to just be one out of five chapters. Um, it's got a really active online sort of space and, uh, you know, it's, it's really cracked the nut of what asynchronous collaborative working looks like, you know, across, across the world. It's got sort of 400 plus contributors internationally. It runs regular talks and collaborative working sessions to kind of co-work as the community and to share, sh share knowledge. And while it doesn't run an annual sort of conference of its own, it does do these sort of week-long book dashes where people come together and do that sort of deep work together. Um, and it's taken that uh, philosophy of curate rather than compete, you know, to how it organizes itself and often hosts much, many of its workshops and activities at events other communities are holding to kind of bridge those practices into those communities and, and welcome members of those communities into its own. Um, and more recently, it's been doing this in a sort of structured way with, with industry to sort of bridge practices from academia to industry as part of a practitioner hub uh, 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 um, inside the, the Turing sort of bridge AI initiative. So, you know, sort of thinking about those three examples, I think some sort of, you know, commonalities and takeaways from there are that this sense of belonging and connection is a huge part of what people get out of being part of communities. And, um, uh, being a forum to sort of share knowledge and experiences with others who are in the same situation as you and, and in a way where you're sort of not feeling like you're exposed to something that you, you know, you should know already and providing that sort of mutual peer support. You know, the community, we talk about communities as they're a thing, but really it's the people inside them and, and so much of the work they do is, is person to person um, and there is, a, you know, a structure and a space and a uh, support for collaborating together on, on, on common challenges. And, um, you know, a common theme in many of the communities we're involved in is this one around, well, look, this is part of my job, but like maybe I'm the only person doing this in my organization, or maybe we're sort of feeling like we're sort of figuring this out ourselves. And so how can we, as a wider community, sort of leverage that to provide kind of careers and, uh, you know, skill structures and, 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 and career development and, and sort of make that's sort of something that works across organizations. And if it was to sum all that together, I'd say, look, it's about going further together, and that's the real power of, of communities. Um, and in terms of the types of things communities do, well, you know, we're at one of them now. This is a, a sort of annual sort of event. Um, but I think the work through the year is, is the thing that really makes a community. And I think it's increasingly common for communities to be driven by this sort of active online presence. And I think Import, you know, community events, are, synchronous events are really important and to have them not just, you know, annually, um, but in all the communities we've been talking about so far, there's a huge effort to make these sort of hybrid or, 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 or sort of remote by default. Um, and I think that's a huge part of inclusivity. Um, these, all, you know, all of these communities are reasonably diverse, you know, to get a critical mass, you need a lot of people, but also you need to recognize that within that community, not everyone's the same. And so these working groups for people to come together on the things that matter most for them and work with others to get stuff done are a common, a common theme. And like this structure for volunteer effort, I think is, is really the key to communities. There's a lot of things that communities can do, but they can't do the work for us. And, and you know, we as community members have to do that. But the structure can help us effectively leverage our time and our commitments. Um, and uh, all these communities have got um, you know, focuses on inclusive participation, whether that's you know, making it easy you know, to be sort of remote or hybrid first, providing accessibility tooling to, to sort of connect into those events or to come to an event in person that you might not be able to sort of financially uh, participate in. Um, and then you know, each of them, whether it's an annual conference or something else, have these kind of deep 
intense sort of focal events that bring the community together to do some sort of deep connect connection and engagement together. Uh, so um, next I'm going to sort of dive in a bit to sort of how these communities structure themselves and, and, and sort of whether we can pull out any sort of general lessons about that. So for the RSE community, I mean, it's a formal organization at the moment, but it's still the online community is about 10 times larger than the formal membership. It's, it's where the work happens. And, you know, and what that turns out, you know, in person is mo a lot of the work is done at the local and regional level where folks who live near each other and work near each other sort of connect more frequently. And increasingly with you know, supporting the same sort of structures for community interest groups around particular sort of activities. And while we were initially an informal association and got a lot done that way, including you know, the first few conferences, we're now an independent legal entity. Um, and that comes with some advantages. You know, we receive and distribute funding, um, but we are still primarily reliant on volunteer effort. And I think that's just a key takeaway. No matter how formal and structured you are, even if you're you know, in a separate kind of legal organization, the work is all about the people. In the TRE community, it's only two years old. It's still very much an informal community. Um, I think a key thing we've sort of noticed is while the initial people were like, yeah, let's build a TRE together, and there was this sort of builder focus, very rapidly in that first year of meetings, it became clear that the community was much broader than that. And it's about the folks who are kind of running those, the folks who are using them, and the folks who are sort of developing the, the sort of governance around how we use this data safely, of which the tool and the platform is just one part. Um, I think a key thing that's worked really well for this group is to have this core community management group. And I think we see that, like that we've got trustees for the Society of uh, uh, Research Software Engineering, and before that there was a steering group. Um, the Turing Way has, 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 a, has a sort of core group of people as well. And I think this, this is sort of key both for having that kind of momentum and, you know, to bring the community forward and to work on how the community works and evolve to the needs of its members, but also in making sure that it does represent the whole community and not just those who are putting the work in. It's got so working groups of focus areas. We've seen that sort of in the RSC community. We've got some financial and kind support. So I think the biggest one is each member is volunteering their own time. And many of our organizations are you know, making an in-kind donation of our time because we get to do it during our work day. Um, but we also have you know, some, some organizations who are able to kind of put more like a half person in or a whole person in for a period. And that really makes a difference, especially to that core thing. And we've had some brilliant in-kind support, uh, sorry, uh, financial support from sort of their UK and HDR UK, especially around the conference. Um, the community is formalizing its governance model at the moment. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. <coughs> Um, but I think that's a very common thing that happens. You know, you start out very informal and then you start to kind of capture community norms as, as, as a sort of part of the structure that the community provides. So the Turing Way is sort of very deliberate about sort of how it organizes itself and making that something that the whole community does. And it has these quarterly community-wide forums that let anyone sort of contribute to how, that, how the community operates. It's got similar working groups, focus areas, um, and it has a very structured way to support members in taking that ownership of the community, whether that's kind of uh, running one of the working groups or whether that's coming in, you know, and making your first contribution rather than sort of being a consumer of the, the outputs or whether that's taking that next step and becoming part of the community's kind of organizational structure. And it's got this very strong support for inclusivity and that's both in what it's producing, ensuring that the guide itself is accessible to those who, who, who sort of might need say screen readers or other things and language and translations but you know, critically for the community itself. And, and I think this is a community that we can really sort of take some lessons from here. And in fact, the TRE community has borrowed a lot from the Turing Way when, when, when looking at how, how it organizes itself. Again, some financial and kind support, mostly from the Turing, where, where we were funding this as a project for quite some time. And, um, and I think you know, that's got its own challenges. You know, if, if an organization is putting a lot of effort in, how do you make sure that organization is get, you know, sort of still sees that as valuable so that it's supporting the community but doesn't sort of take over. And I think Emma has some thoughts on that in some of the communities she's been involved in. Um, and again, it's sort of going through the process of sort of formalizing its governance model uh, sort of and doing a lot of sort of careful thinking around that. And I think this seems to be a natural sort of progression for communities as they evolve. So what are these, you know, to distill that down, what are the you know, things we're seeing in common across these communities that you know, maybe might be applicable to others that you're involved in? I think they all start out informal and at some point, they all develop some sort of formal structure. They don't all become legal entities. I think that's the exception rather than the rule. But this sort of formal governance and this structure is 
sort of how you bake in the community's norms and, and expectations, you know, that's not reliant on the individuals doing it at the time. It's not unusual for scope or goals to evolve over time and communities should be okay with that. You know, we're, we're here to do what's important to our members and if that evolves or, or we find that our community is wider than we thought it was, you know, let's lean into that. Um, almost every community ends up with some sort of substructure to let those who care most about something get trained and work with those who, who also care about it or, you know, where people have sub-identities. Um, and, you know, while I say it's a sort of volunteer um, and a huge in-kind contribution is just summed up over all of the individual sort of donations that we make as, as members, um, having these kind of key uh, sort of uh, in-kind and financial donations to kind of help with some of that core enabling sort of um, work, I think really helps. So thinking about some of the challenges we've had to kind of growing and sustaining these communities and sort of what insights we might kind of glean if we were sort of starting again, um, I think, or to, you know, that other communities might want to think about as they organize themselves. Um, from the RSE community, I think, even though we ended up as a formal organization, you can do a lot with volunteer effort, like a huge amount. You know, our conference was pretty much operating at the same scale it is now with volunteer effort, and it, it is still largely a volunteer effort. There's, you know, 25 people sort of helping organize it, and the run up to it, another 25 people volunteering. Uh, to, to, to kind of make it happen on the ground. Um, but that dedicated support really helps. So we've been very fortunate in this community that early on the Software Sustainability Institute has donated half of the community manager's time. And that's been like critical both to kind of have that constant momentum and, and leverage the donations of time that others are giving more opportunistically, but also to provide some of that institutional memory. And we've worked very hard to kind of leverage that in how we work our, our trustee transitions as we become a formal organization. Um, this strong common sense of belonging, like really that's the, the sort of core, I think, of what people feel from this community. It's so common to hear from someone who's come to the conference for the first time that they've sort of found their people. And, and I think that's something we see in sort of other successful communities as well. But also our community has many sub-identities. You know, we say it's the research software engineering community. That's got a huge brand now. It's difficult to change. But actually that's kind of one job title out of all the people we would consider to be doing research software engineering in their roles. Still, the vast majority of them will have some kind of researcher job title. Others will be research computing engineers, research infrastructure engineers, um, might be data scientists, data wranglers, um, might be you know, community managers or, or research application managers or, or, or sort of agile project people. And uh, these would all be folks that we would welcome in under the umbrella, but research software engineer is the name for the, or research software engineer ring is the kind of society name and also the name for one of the roles. And I think you know, that put, you know, we need to do a lot of work there to ensure that people with, whose job title doesn't match the name of the, the society also sort of feel equally included. Um, maintaining momentum on long-term initiatives is hard. You know, we've got 12 to 14 trustees at any point in time, two-thirds of which have been in the role for a year or more. We have stable kind of leadership in our sort of subgroups and working groups, and it's still really hard to maintain that kind of long-term momentum. And, and it's because we've all got busy day jobs and because we're all volunteers. And even with that kind of support from community, you know, dedicated 50% community manager, it's just really, really hard. Um, so I'd say, you know, recognize that and don't beat yourselves up about it. But like that's, if we can figure that out, I think that is, you know, like a real, real piece of value to, to successful communities. We're very fortunate. We have a, a surplus generated from our annual conference. Thanks mostly to really generous donations um, from sponsors. So the ticket price doesn't cover the, the, you know, the cost of the, the conference, but that really lets us put financial support into the activity during the year. And, and again, that can provide just enough extra that people can justify spending that time to organize an event because we're able to cover the catering or we can pay bursaries for people to come and attend. Um, but we still rely a lot on in-kind support. And again, the vast majority of that is people's time as active members of the community, but it's also people hosting you know, meetings for subgroups and so on at their institutes, providing tea and coffee, um, you know, providing uh, sort of um, other, other kind of, you know, online support for, for sort of asynchronous connections or, or online meetings. So, um, you know, thinking about the UK TOE community, well, again, I think there's some common themes here, you know, in-kind and financial contributions really help, you know, they're sort of force multipliers, um, especially if you can have them sort of be part of this core support and really help those not just delivering the work for the community, but also working on how the community sort of manages itself to be able to do that effectively by just turning up for a period here and there and 
you know, been nudged to do the stuff in between. Um, it expanded from this initial narrow focus, and, and I think we see that in a few communities. Um, again, maintaining momentum on activities hard. Like, you know, there's, I think still more than half the work the working groups do happens while we're together. Um, I think some are sort of, you know, have more momentum in between than others. Um, and again, I think that's sort of natural, and it's sort of aligned to kind of how much the thing the group's working on matters back home in the day job. Um, but again, that's something that, you know, we, we, we sort of, if we can sort of work to improve, we'll really improve kind of the value of the community to our members. Um, there's a real thing we've been working, thinking very hard about on, you know, how do you ensure that as you structure the community and its work, you're kind of gathering the consensus and representing the whole community, but also, you know, respecting and, 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 you know, the fact that people are turning up and wanting to get work done and, and, and letting that happen and that momentum build. And, um, you know, I think here as well as in the, the, the uh, uh, Turing way, you know, where one organization is providing sort of significant support, how do you sort of ensure that that community is there for everyone and, and, that, and that, you know, that support is, is there for the community, but still in a way that the, the organization providing it feels that they're, they're sort of getting uh, value out of that. Um, so finally, sort of in the Turing way, what does this look like? Well, paid community managers have been a real help, not just to kind of enable and empower uh, sort of the community momentum, but to enable the community to kind of be that deeply reflective and, 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 and rapid learning sort of community that can you know, steer itself and shape itself around its members' needs. Um, again, it's sort of expanded beyond its initial focus around reproducibility, but that core of uh, sort of being an open collaborative co-creation and it's been an open sort of welcoming community uh, that sort of works together has been, you know, a core part from the beginning. Um, it was working really sort of deliberately on structure and governance for distributing power. And that's not just about ensuring that the Turing doesn't sort of dominate, but it's about ensuring that your kind of, the role you can play in the community isn't bound by the seniority and, and role you play outside the community um, and the power you hold outside it. Um, I think there's this really sort of interesting thing that the community is thinking very deliberately about that, you know, it's, yes, it's got this output, which is the, the, the Turing way, which is this sort of guide that others can use and consume. But actually, you know, it's, it's, it's also this huge you know, community of practice that bring, you know, that people can come together and do this difficult work together um, and that others can sort of find a home in who are thinking about this in their place. And those, those are sort of like big, you know, both, both big valuable sort of contributions from the community and reasons for being. Um, and, you know, both that kind of structure of this sort of, sort of book that curates rather than, than, than competes and, and, the, and particularly the ways of organizing the community have been adopted by other communities, including the TRE community. Um, so just to sort of summarize, I think some of those sort of key takeaways and maybe sort of take us in with some thoughts into the panel session. Um, I think the big one I'd say is communities are their people, regardless of the structure and how well we do everything else and the support that we get sort of for core, um, you know, community management or financial support we get to put on workshops and conferences. I, they just wouldn't happen without our people. And the vast majority of that in-kind donation is summed up over lots and lots of individuals. Um, but that structure that the community provides, even if it's, you know, at its early days, all best efforts from its members can really force multiply member time. The, you know, the fact you've got this thing in your diary for half a day or a few hours and you come together and you do that work, I think can really, really sort of mean that together we're more than the sum of our parts. Um, this dedicated core support like really, really helps. If you can find a way to do it, whether that's through a sort of kind organization who, where people are able to spend that time, maybe build to a project or as part of their day job, um, or some organizations prepared to sort of sponsor it, that sort of really, really helps to kind of build and sustain that structure. Um, and, you know, I guess a broader way of saying that is that little funding and in-kind support sort of goes a, you know, a, a long way in, in enabling the community. Um, I think that sort of point we talked about with the TRE community is actually much broader, this, this challenge of empowering action versus, you know, rep, you know, consensus across the community. These communities are broad, but any individual uh, will have at different times more bandwidth to, to contribute to the community or be able to spend their day job versus their nighttime or will be, uh, you know, find that the work they're doing back home is the work the community's doing and therefore, you know, they can sort of contribute. Um, but the community doesn't happen without the, us putting that work in and we need to recognize that that's why people kind of find doing it together sort of is valuable. So we need to enable that and, and, and let that momentum build, but also 
you know, being you know, deliberate as we do that, that we're not kind of taking the community in a, in a way that the sort of wider, you know, that isolates others in, in, within it. Um, and just to sort of finish with a couple of just observations about stuff that's difficult. I mean, sustainability is hard, whether that's sustaining momentum between sort of working group sessions or whether that's sustaining the kind of structure and the culture of the community as the people kind of change or as the people who can focus their time sort of change. Um, and, and, you know, if you're trying to use governance to sort of solve that and, and, and sort of formal structures, like that is hard itself. You know, you start to write down some of these implicit norms and they're not necessarily initially the same ones everyone had in their head. And that's a huge piece of work and it's something that needs to be done very deliberately. And it's something the Turing Way has been sort of doing and sharing how they're doing and can be sort of like, you know, adopted by others. Um, so that's all, of, all I had to say. And um, there'll be plenty more time in the panel discussion to, to talk about this a bit more. But if you want to learn about any of the communities I talked about today, here's the sort of jumping off points. And as I said, the TRE community and the Turing Way community will be running workshops today. Um, and I just wanted to highlight a paper that the community management team at the Turing have written recently on sort of professionalizing these community management roles in this sort of modern interdisciplinary kind of big science um, uh, sort of environment, um, uh, which you can sort of get to from this archive link here. Um, and with that, I'm, I'm done. Thank you very much.